Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Mark 2, verses 1 to 12. So a little bit of context. Mark chapter 1, it really gives the readers a taste of Christ's ministry and the mostly positive responses to it. So Jesus is doing three main things. He's teaching, he's healing, and he's driving out demons. And the emphasis on Mark chapter 1 is on the authority of Jesus. The authority of Jesus. In Greek, the exousia, the authority, the power of Jesus Christ. And in Mark 1, you see over and over again, his fame as a miracle worker, as an exorcist, continues to grow. His fame continues to grow. But as we said before, he's not in it for the fame. And a lot of people are amazed. A lot of crowds are amazed. They're astonished at the things that he's doing. But being amazed does not mean that they are faithful. There's a difference between saying wow to Jesus and saying I surrender all to Jesus. So, But he's, he's very popular. He's getting kind of this celebrity status in Palestine. So he's, he's doing all these great things. And you would think that the Jews would be happy because the long-awaited Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, who has been uh, foretold, who's supposed to be from the line of King David, and he's finally come. And you would think that people would be happy about this. And he's doing all these wonderful things. I mean, who could get mad at a guy who's going around healing people and driving out demons? Like, how do you, how can you get mad at him? So, but we'll see about that tonight, you know. So Mark 1 is pretty, it's a pretty nice story. Pretty nice account of all the positive things Jesus is doing. And then Mark 2, we see a little bit of a shift. There's um, a lot of opposition that starts to grow in Mark chapter 2. So once again, Mark 1 is focusing on the exousia, the power of Jesus Christ, the authority he has. And then Mark 2, we see the opposition to that authority. So Mark 2, verses 1 to Mark 3, chapter 6, you're going to see five episodes that are all controversial. All controversial episodes, from Mark 2, 1 to Mark 3, uh, verse 6. And the Gospels are not always in chronological order. They didn't really write like that. So Mark has likely grouped these things together. So you see a lot of controversy, a lot of opposition. So this is the first of those controversy episodes in Mark chapter 2. So first, uh, tonight, the issue is going to be Jesus claiming to forgive sin. Next, from Mark 2, 13 to 17, he's fellowshipping with the unclean, with the sinners. Then it's going to be him uh, not fasting, him and his disciples not fasting. Then they're going to come at Jesus about working on the Sabbath. Then they're going to come at him about healing on the Sabbath, finally, in Mark chapter 3. Verses 1 to 6. So you see these five ep episodes. The opposition just rises and rises and rises until it climaxes in a plot to kill him. So we see this in right at the end of this section. Mark chapter 3, verse 6. At the bottom here, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. How they might kill Jesus. So the crowds are loving him, but by the end of Mark 3 verse 6 they're trying to kill him the religious leaders the pharisees the other parties are trying to kill him so this section could really be called jesus meets his critics in galilee jesus meets his critics in galilee so that's a little bit of context about where this passage is situated in the gospel of mark all right so mark chapter 2 verse 1 mark 2 verse 1 and having gone into capernaum again after some days, it was heard that he was at home. After some days, it was heard that he was at home. So Jesus is back in the house. Literally, in the Greek, says he's in a house. Now, Jesus, he grew up in Nazareth. He's known as Jesus of Nazareth, which is several miles southwest. So this is likely not Jesus's house, um, but his home or his headquarters, his home base, seemed to be in the town of Capernaum. Now, this home may have been uh, the home of his disciples, maybe uh, Peter and um, Andrew, likely not his house because he didn't have any wife or children. He did not have a wife or children. So this might have been Peter's house, which he had already visited when he healed Peter's mother-in-law in Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 31. So Jesus, his first preaching tour through Galilee was complete at this time. He's, he was started in Capernaum. He was in the synagogue. He drove out some demons. He healed Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum. Then he was healing and driving out demons of a lot of other people. And then uh, the next day, um, he goes off to a solitary place and he prays. 
and Peter and his companions are hunting him down like, hey, like, what's going on? Like, we had a good night last night. You know, we had some good ministry, did some good healing, did some good exercising uh, of demons. So, you know, everyone's looking for you now. Where are you at? And Jesus is like, you have to go somewhere else because I was sent here to preach. That's why I've come. He's come to preach. So the healings and the exorcisms, they come secondary. They confirm the message. They are not the main thing. So his first preaching tour, Jesus went on tour and now he's back home. So, of course, when he comes home, everyone wants to see Jesus. Jesus is back. So Mark chapter 2, verse 2. And so many were gathered that they could no longer make room, not even by the door. And he was speaking the word to them. He was speaking the word to them. My father is one of 11 children, as many of you know already. And when we all get together, you know, pre-COVID-19, when you get all the Scottons in one place, and you'd be surprised, over the years, we had many family affairs in, you know, in houses that, you know, aren't super big, but, you know, you, you get you get used to it, and it's just, you gotta, you know, excuse me, pardon me, you gotta show your way through, you get used to there being a packed house, so you go to a Scott, and, a Scott and birthday party, or Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever it was, you know, we would, we would pack them in there, because, you know, out of all my grandma's 11 children, most of them live in the area, and a lot of people come out. It's a family affair. So but anyway, here we have a packed house. It's a packed house. A lot of people are coming to see Jesus. But as we said before, just because someone's in a crowd doesn't mean that they're repenting and believing in Jesus, as was his message. The word here likely means the gospel message. And the first words that Jesus says in the gospel of Mark, once again, at the bottom here, and saying the appointed time has been fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come. Or come near. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus' first words in ministry in the gospel of Mark. So he's not healing. He's not driving out demons right here. At least we don't, we're not told that. He's preaching the word. He's preaching the word and that was his primary mission. So this is likely not the entire town that was inside or outside the door. But it was, it was packed. It was packed. So it's a packed house. Moving on to verse 3, chapter 2. And some people come bringing to him a paralyzed man, being carried by four of them. And some people come bringing to him a paralyzed man, being carried by four of them. So during this time, poverty and disease went almost hand in hand. So this paralyzed man, because he was paralyzed, we don't know exactly why. We don't know the nature of his illness, of his condition. But because he was paralyzed, he likely was not able to work. So, like we said, poverty and disease often went hand in hand. So he's likely someone who had to beg, you know, for money, who was dependent on the alms and the, the goodwill and charity of others. So we're not sure if this man was a beggar, but beggars were often handicapped or suffered from a chronic disease. Now, has anyone ever asked you for a ride? Anyone ever ask you for a ride home? And sometimes, you know, you'd be like, um, I can give you a ride, but uh, you got some gas money. <laughs> you got some gas money. I saw a couple cartoons online. If you don't have gas money, then before you ask someone for a ride, you should ask yourself, can I walk? <laughs> and uh, I think we got exhibit here, too. The look when someone asks if they can get a ride, if they give you gas, for, for, if they give you $5 for gas, you know. Sometimes it kind of depends, you know, where where the ride is, how far away out of my way is the ride. You know, people might have to, you know, make some some uh, decisions. But a lot of times, you know, if we're honest, we don't feel like giving people rides. We don't feel like giving people rides. And we got cars with gasoline. Some of us got electric cars. And here this brother had four guys carry him to Jesus. They carry him. You want to see that it's on a mat. So, you know, they used to sing that song, uh, That's What Friends Are For. I guess this guy has some good friends. This guy has some good friends that were willing to carry him to Jesus. Carry him to Jesus. And sometimes, you know, I don't like giving people rods. So, <laughs> that's some good friends right there. All right, so moving right along in verse 4. And not being able to bring the man to him through the crowd, 
they remove a part of the roof where he was, and having dug through, they lower the mat where the paralyzed man was lying. So, they have to tear the roof off. Essentially, they have to tear the roof off. Literally, in the Greek, it says, unroofed the roof. They unroofed the roof. Now, this is not the entire roof. They just unroofed a part of the roof. Now, roofs were often accessible via outside steps. So, see in this picture, a lot of times the, uh, the steps will go right up to the, the roof of the house. And this is where items could be sun-dried. Typically, roofs were flat and were strong enough for people to walk on it and even sleep on the roof. The roofs often had wooden rafters made of heavy beams. They could be plastered with mud or sod with branches and thatch. And sometimes they were mixed with lime or stone. So none of this would be pretty hard to dig through. And we'll see in Luke, in his parallel account, it says, when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. So they didn't tear the whole roof off, but they did, they did have to tear you know, part of the roof off. So, again, these are pretty good friends. Not only did they carry this guy to Jesus, they had to carry him up some stairs and then lower him down to the roof. That's pretty amazing. Those are some good friends. How many of us could say we got friends like that? <laughs> good evening, Sister Garrett. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Sister Cunningham. Good evening. Good evening to everyone. We are in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Spiritual paralysis is the theme for tonight. So now imagine, you know, imagine you're Jesus and, you know, he's preaching the word right now. He's, he's speaking the word, it says. And then someone just starts unroofing the roof, like right above you. And what well, we just said it's made of, you know, plaster and, and uh, or plaster with mud and sod and branch and thatches and lime and stone sometimes. A lot of people had to get dirty like this. <laughs> this has to be pretty inconvenient. Like imagine being like mid sermon and someone just starts digging through the roof. Like someone right now just starts, you know, there's going to be dust everywhere. I'm going to be covered with everything. So. This kind of would have been a little bit uh, disrespectful. Some people might have uh, not taken too kindly to this. And they likely would have had to, to cover the repairs. They would have to pay for this for sure. But uh, material things are not as important as healing. Material things are not as important as healing. We see over and over in scripture that possessions are not as important as people. And we'll get back to that later on. Animals are not as important as people. So we see in, in Mark chapter 5, there's actually a man who is possessed by a number of demons. They say they're a legion, a legion of demons. And Jesus exercises them, he casts them out, he drives the demons out. And he drives them out into a herd of pigs. Into a herd of pigs. Now, of course, the Jews did not eat pigs. So a bunch of pigs wouldn't likely have been a big loss to many people. But for me, man, I love bacon. I don't know about you, but I love bacon. Bacon is is very tasty. My wife she doesn't make it in the in the skillet. She'll put it in the um in the oven and put some brown sugar on it, and it's just super tasty. And I, I can eat that all day. So I'm just like there's so many pigs that were you know so much bacon, so much pork that was wasted. But again, material things are not as important as healing. Not as important as people becoming made whole and the word mat here is uh, refers to a mat that a sick person or usually a poor person uh, would have with them a poor person's mat so this guy likely didn't have a lot of money so they tear part of the roof off everyone's probably getting showered with dirt and dust and everything else branches whatever they got up there and this is uh, pretty amazing so chapter 2 verse 5 and having seen their faith Jesus says to the paralyzed man, child, your sins are forgiven. Child, your sins are forgiven. Very interesting sentence. Very interesting. So let's first talk about faith. He's having seen their faith. So faith is important in a lot of the healing accounts in the Gospel of Mark. Remember the, the woman with the issue of bleeding. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garments, 
if I can just touch the hem of his garments. Uh, Jairus had great faith. He's like, just say the word and my, my daughter will be healed. Uh, blind Bartimaeus calls out to him, you know, son of man, son of man, or son of David, I think he says. And a lot of these people have great faith. And they have a faith that overcomes obstacles. They have faith in action. And that's the thing, that faith is not merely a mindset. Faith is not something you think. It's not about believing that certain things are true. As you already said, and you'll see in the Gospel of Mark, even demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Even demons believe that Jesus is the Holy One of God. James 2, you know, we talks about faith and, and works, faith and deeds. Um, you believe there's one God? Good. Even demons believe that, and they shudder. So it's not about just agreeing with certain propositional truths. Well, I, I agree to this. I assent. I intellectually assent with these certain, you know, items of doctrine. It's about putting that faith into action. A difference between belief that something is true and believe in something to be true. So believing in something to be true always manifests itself in action. So true biblical Christian faith manifests itself with godly works of obedience and mercy. Faith without these type of works is dead. So-called faith like that is dead. So we see here faith in action. They have literally carried this man up some stairs, dug through a roof. They're putting their faith, their active trust in action. We see this over and over again in scripture that people overcome obstacles. They cross social boundaries and or go to great lengths to come to Jesus. And that is impressive to Jesus. When you go above and beyond, that's great faith. So the paralytic, the paralyzed man, this is the first example of this kind of faith in action. Now, he likely didn't have faith that Jesus was the uh, savior of the world or the son of God or maybe not even the Messiah of Israel. But he has faith in Jesus' message that he's been preaching. Because Jesus has been preaching. He's been on a preaching tour. People know about him. He's kind of a celebrity right now. And he has faith that this man can manifest the inbreaking kingdom of God that he's been preaching about. And he's manifesting it through healing. So once again, faith is not merely knowledge about Jesus, but active trust in Jesus. As it's been said, it's an attitude expressed in conduct. An attitude expressed in conduct. So some think that the faith that Jesus sees is primarily that of the four men that are carrying the man. And we do see that other places in scripture where, especially in the Gospel of Mark, where other people petition Jesus, you know, for other people. So, for example, Jairus asked Jesus to heal his daughter. The Syrophoenician woman asked Jesus to heal. I believe it's her daughter as well. Let me just double check that. Yeah, her, her daughter was possessed by a demon. So we see people making faithful requests on behalf of other people. But at the same time, it's hard to think that the paralyzed man didn't have faith in Jesus himself. It's hard to think that he went to Jesus unwillingly. Like they had to literally drag him there, you know, against his wishes. So, you know, I think it's a pretty, pretty much a moot point that, um, you know, whose faith did Jesus see? I think he sees all their faith in action. So their faith is evident and as has been said, their undeterred determination to actively approach Jesus. Undeterred determination to actively approach Jesus. But it's kind of funny to think of them digging a hole through the roof. That's just that's just a sight to behold had to be, you know. But that shows how desperate they were. Imagine being a man who was unable to walk. We don't know if it was from birth or how long he's been lame, but he can't walk. Like, wouldn't you do whatever you had to do? Wouldn't you do anything if it meant that you had a chance to get healed? So I'm sure it had to be inconvenient for Jesus who might have been, you know, preaching. She might have been like right in the middle of his sermon and just, you know, dust particles start falling in his hair. But um, I can see it from the other guy's point of view. Like, hey, I'm trying to get my friend healed. You know, that's that's a lot. That's very important. So he wants to do whatever it takes. Money means necessary. He wants to get healed. I can't be mad at that. But a surprising thing is that Jesus says, child, your sins are forgiven. 
Imagine going to a doctor and you got, you know, you broke, you broke both your legs or something. And the doctor's like, yeah, the x-ray came back and you have some sin in your life. You have some sin in your life. Like what? <laughs> I came here for healing, Jesus. What are you talking about sin for? What are you talking about sin for? Now, in this time period, people did often associate disease with sin. So many people probably assumed that he was paralyzed because of a sin he committed or someone in his family had committed. A later rabbinic saying from a later rabbi says, no one gets up from his sickbed unless all his sins are forgiven. That's a very common view. Now, that being said, sin can lead to death and disease. In the Old Testament, we see it over and over again. We, we, we quote the scripture all the time, Second Chronicles 7.14, but you know, context is always important. So just an example of disease being linked to sin in the Old Testament. Uh, verse 13 of Second Chronicles 7, verses 13 to 14. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts, to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. If my people who are called by my name, and humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So this is after the Lord it says he shuts up the heavens, so there's a drought, or there's locusts, or there's sickness, there's a plague. He's, the people need to repent. So that's the context of that scripture. Exodus fifteen twenty six says, he said, uh, this is uh, the Lord saying, if you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So again, we see that there is preservation from disease. From doing what is right. See this in Deuteronomy as well. If you pay attention to these laws. And are careful to follow them. Then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you. As he swore to your ancestors. That's verse 12 of Deuteronomy 7. Skipping down to verse 15. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you. The horrible diseases you knew in Egypt. But he will inflict them on all who hate you. So this is part of the, the old covenant. That you know disease. Was associated with. Um, sin and following the Lord's commands, following his will, his statutes was associated with not having disease. Other things, not uh, being barren and all these other things you'll see in Deuteronomy 7 um, as well. So you can understand why people would think like this. And this is not just uh, a new, an Old Testament phenomenon. We see sin can lead to disease and death in the New Testament. So when we talk about communion, you know, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he says, for those of you, uh, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism for death. People were, were taking communion in an ungodly way, you know, not discerning the body of Christ, um, the fellow uh, Christians. So you have rich people there that were eating and, and having plenty and, and gorging themselves. And you had poor people that weren't having enough. Um, so there was some judgment because of that. We see. It's an interesting story or interesting account in Acts 12, 19b to 23. Uh, this is not the original King Herod, but um, his grandson, I believe. So then Herod went from Judea. I think Herod Agrippa. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. They said, This is a voice of a god not of a man immediately because Herod did not give praise to God an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died you can think of Ananias and Sapphira who who cheated 
who lied about how much money they got from selling their houses to give to the church in Acts 5, 1 through 11, who also fell down and died. A lot of places in Scripture, even the New Testament, where death can be linked to sin. Keyword can, not necessarily. And it's interesting that healing and forgiving are often synonymous. Healing and forgiving are often synonymous in Scripture. So some examples of healing and forgiveness being synonymous. So Psalm 41, 4 says, I said, have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. Jeremiah three twenty two a the Lord says, return faithless people. I will cure you of backsliding. In Hosea 14, 4, the Lord says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. Again, healing and f- sin being linked. And of course, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, famous passage. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. It's the prophetic passage of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, fulfilled by Jesus Christ, who by his wounds we are healed. Again, this healing through the wounds of Christ, and this healing refers to our forgiveness. So again, again, healing and forgiving are often synonymous, is the point I want to make here. But of course, sickness is not necessarily caused by sin. So I want to be very careful in saying that sin in the Old Testament and New Testament and probably today can lead to sickness and death, but not necessarily. Job, we know, went through a lot of things and he was not uh, sinning against the Lord. In Galatians 4.13, Paul even says, as you know, it it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even Paul had suffered some illnesses while he was in ministry. Oh, yes. And finally, in John 9, 1 to 3, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So sometimes it's just the Lord's will and he might bring something better out of, out of that situation and that his work might be displayed. So again, don't walk away tonight saying that Minister Scott said that uh, all sin leads to disease or all disease comes from sin. Not necessarily, not necessarily, but it can So that being said, we don't know the man who was paralyzed. He may have been ill. He may have been paralyzed because of sin. I don't know. But Jesus would know. Jesus definitely knows better than I would. and knows better than any of us knows about the situation. We don't know. And the man himself, he may have been aware that there was some sin in his life or something he'd done in his past that was that caused his condition. We don't know. We know that Jesus knows. But once again, Jesus primarily comes for for forgiveness and spiritual salvation. He primarily comes for forgiveness and spiritual salvation as he ushers in the kingdom of God. This is his primary purpose, spiritual salvation, not just making people feel better and giving them band-aids and and helping them um, in their temporary earthly troubles, but giving them everlasting life through a reconciled relationship through his atoning blood on the cross. So once again, healings are secondary and they confirm the gospel that Jesus preaches. Now, disease, decay and death, they're present in the world because of sin at the fall. Regardless, the man's and mankind's main ailment was and is sin. So when you look at it like this, so Jesus came to usher in the kingdom, the kingdom of God. There's going to be no more crying, no more pain, no more disease, no more decay, no more sin. So Jesus is ushering in this kingdom. It's going to be fully consummated when he comes back again. So when he's doing this battle, we, we see in Mark that Jesus is doing spiritual battle, spiritual warfare. He's going up against demons. And when he's healing, he's, he's reversing the effects of the fall. Sin came through the fall of man when, when Adam sinned in the garden. 
So, for example, Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Won't get too deep into Romans right now, but death came through sin and through the sin of one man. And in this way, death came to all people. So, once again, the overall point is that sin came, when sin came, that is where death came. So, death and disease are a byproduct of sin. So, if you're trying to do away with death and disease, those things are symptomatic of the greater problem. The greater problem is sin. Sin is what causes death and disease. Ultimately, not necessarily in each and every case, but ultimately, originally, it was not supposed to be like that. But because sin came into the world, death and disease came into the world. So Jesus is going right at the pathogen. He's going at, at the, the root of the problem, not just the symptoms. You know, when you have a um, an infection, you know, you might be nauseous, you might have a runny nose, uh, you might have a fever. Now, you can take fever medication, you can take, you know, some triaminic and some other different medications for stuffy nose. Uh, you can take, um, you know, all the, you know, the drugs. <laughs> and you could take, you know, some uh, Pepto-Bismol, some Tums for an uh, upset stomach. But you see how those are all addressing the symptoms. Eventually, you have to take something for the infection. You got to take some penicillin. So Jesus is the penicillin. He's going right at the, the root of the cause and not just the symptoms. So when you see that, that the healings and exorcisms, those are handling the symptoms, but Jesus is going right at the root of the cause, which is sin. So once again, Jesus comes to bring about the reversal of the fall and its side effects. The reversal of the fall and its symptoms. Jesus comes to reverse all of that. So once you see the big picture, the kingdom of God is reversing what happened in the garden and really what happened at the Tower of Babel. But that's a, a topic for another day. That's a very interesting. But Jesus comes to reverse the fall and its symptoms. So as has been said, consequently, every healing is a driving back of death and an invasion of the province of sin. The kingdom of God is inbreaking. It's small, like a mustard seed that grows. So Jesus is invading the dominion of, of Satan. He's driving back death and disease. He's driving out demons. So Jesus, once again, spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. It's so much bigger than our individual problems and people's individual infirmities. Jesus is driving back the dominion of Satan. So we talked about sin and disease and, and the um, how they can be connected, but not necessarily so. But Jesus came to go at the, the main issue, which is sin and not just the symptoms, which is death and disease and even demonic possession. Anyway, Jesus talks about, child, your sins are forgiven. And people are like, what, what you talking about, Jesus? What you talking about here, man? Now, child is a, a term of endearment. So we don't know if Jesus was older than the guy, but it's just a, a likely a reassuring uh, word just to, to reassure the guy that things are going to be all right. So the teachers of the law, they know that only God can forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. However, God's agents, they could pronounce forgiveness of sins, like the priests on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Yom is Day Kippur, Atonement, Day of Atonement. So some people see Jesus' words as a divine passive. So essentially, Jesus would be saying, God has forgiven your sin. So when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, he's saying, perhaps, God has forgiven your sin. We see um, that the priests, they can make atonement for people on the Day of Atonement and, and by different sacrifices in Leviticus. You can see that um, in Second Samuel twelve thirteen, We see Nathan, the prophet Nathan says to David, Then David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord God, against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. So, you know, here David has repented and the prophet has spoken uh, for the Lord. So the prophet himself, Nathan, is not forgiving him because he doesn't have that authority. So this could be just Jesus pronouncing that God, the Father, has forgiven the man's sins. However, Jesus was not a priest and there was no sacrifice. There's no even uh, clear evidence of repentance in this case. But if this is true, then the, the teachers will be charging Jesus with presumption. They're presuming that Jesus, they're, they're saying that Jesus is presuming that the man's sins are forgiven 
when they don't know that's necessarily the case. So that's one way to look at it. But given how they respond in verse 10, um, it's much more likely that Jesus is claiming divine authority to forgive sin himself. Not just to pronounce forgiveness, but to bring about forgiveness. And he's pronouncing forgiveness, or not pronouncing, he's bringing about forgiveness apart from the temple, apart from the temple sacrifices that were made for centuries. And John the Baptist, he offered a repentance baptism back in Mark 1, 4. But Jesus goes beyond what John the Baptist does. He's offering forgiveness wholly apart of the sacrificial blood of, of goats and rams and lambs and such. So, and we'll go to, to verse 6 as we make our way through this passage. Now, some of the teachers of the law were there sitting and debating in their hearts. Sitting and debating in their hearts. So, these guys are thinking like, oh, what's he talking about? Now, debating, um, they were pondering, considering their reasoning. Inward deliberation is going on inside their hearts. And as we said before, the heart in Hebrew... Um, a lot of ancient thought. The heart was not just feelings and emotions, but also intellect, will, and the conscience. This is the biblical heart. So the biblical heart is more like a brain, actually. The biblical heart is more like a brain. And I always use this example. King Solomon, you know, he doesn't really ask for wisdom necessarily. He asked, if you see here, First Kings 3, 9. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who was able to govern this great people of yours? So the heart, it thinks, it reasons, it wills, it feels. So deliberating within themselves. Now the teachers of the law, they were scribes. These were the, the people who would copy the scriptures, make manuscript copies, you know, look here and write it over here. And they would also make judgments based on the law. They were the legal experts, the, the, the experts on the, on the law, the Torah of the Lord. So they devoted their entire lives to the study and the application of the law to all life. And later, these teachers of the law, these religious leaders, are going to be the ones that are going to cause Jesus trouble. Now, you would think that the most religious guys around would be the ones who would be on Jesus' side. But not the case. Not the case. The people who should know the scriptures the best and should know that the Messiah has come are the ones who reject him and bring about his, his ultimate crucifixion. So verse 7, they say, why does the guy speak this way? Why does this guy speak this way? He blasphemes. Who was able to forgive sins except the one God? Sometimes people, they be talking all crazy. You'd you be you know, thinking to yourself, like, who does this person think he is? Who does this guy think he is? And, and when we say this guy in the Greek, this is a, a contemptuous um, pronoun here, demonstrative pronoun. So this guy is like, who does he think he is? You know, sometimes you ask somebody, who do you think you are? Who are you talking to? Like, who do you think you are? You think you're God? And essentially, this is what Jesus is doing. He's, he's assuming responsibilities that only God should have. That is, forgiving sins. Now, blasphemy could refer to a variety of acts that dishonor the name of God. The name of the, the divine name. It's not really just pronouncing the divine name without reverence. That is, uh, Yahweh. Um which is likely pronounced, but also included idolatry, disrespect, claiming to do what God can do. These are all considered blasphemy. And nothing in the Jewish literature suggests that any person, even the Messiah or the Son of Man, could forgive sin. So the teachers of the law are saying that this guy is assuming authority that belongs to God alone. Who does he think he is? You see this in John 10, 33, at the bottom here, People say, we are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. You, a mere man, claim to be God. So this is why Jesus was killed. If Jesus was just preaching socialism, like people think, or preaching that we should all get along, or preaching that people should just be nice to each other, there would be no issue. Like, why would he get killed for that? You know, Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to forgive sin. And this is why they tried to kill him. Or they, you know, they did kill him, but he didn't, didn't really stick, you know. <laughs> Rose on the third day. 
They try to stone him because he, a mere man, and what they think is a mere man, claimed to be God. So it could be, you know, God alone, but the one God language recalls Deuteronomy 6, 4, which is the great Shema in Hebrew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. So only God can forgive sin because ultimately all sin is against God. Ultimately, God forgives and we don't. We should forgive people. Jesus says that if you don't forgive, your Heavenly Father won't forgive your sins if you don't forgive other people's sins when they sin against you. But when people do wrong things to us, we should forgive them. But if someone does something wrong, the offense is not merely on the person that are affected by that wrongdoing. Ultimately, the wrong is against God. So if you kill someone, for example, and those the parents or whoever uh, in their family forgives you, that's nice. I commend them for that, but they've destroyed someone who's been made in God's image, so therefore they have sinned against God. Only God can forgive sin because all sin is eventually, is ultimately against God. Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Isaiah 44, 22 says, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Psalm 103, verse 3, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Again, you see that association between sin and forgiveness, healing and forgiveness. The Lord is the one who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Micah seven eighteen says, who is a God like you? Who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Only God can forgive sin. So Jesus is doing something that only God has the prerogative to do. And this is why the teacher of the law are debating in their hearts. They're like, what is Jesus talking about? What are you talking about, Jesus? So if Jesus is not divine, he's blaspheming. He must be, as it's been said, either God or mad or bad. C.S. Lewis said Jesus has to be a liar a lunatic or Lord. He's lying about who he is. He's crazy and he thinks he's something he's not, or he really is the Lord who he claims to be. Now, blasphemy, I won't read all this here. We're running short on time, but if you read Leviticus 24, 10 to 16, actually 10 to 23, blasphemers were killed. Blasphemers were killed. In the Old Testament, you see verse 23, Then Moses spoke to the Israelites, and they took the blasphemer outside the camp and stoned him. This is what they were supposed to do under the Old Covenant. Blasphemy was not something to be trifled with. It was a capital crime. You blaspheme the name of God, you were killed. Not like that anymore. I'm not saying it should be like that anymore. I'm just saying that's how it was. So Jesus says, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You know, uh, you see in verse eight here and straight away, Jesus, having recognized in the spirit that they were debating within themselves in this way, he says to them, why do you debate these things in your heart? Jesus, he knows what they're thinking. So he shows he has immediate supernatural knowledge of their thoughts. He knew that Judas was going to be the one who betrayed him. He knew the Samaritan woman had, you know, five husbands. You know, Jesus has supernatural knowledge. Psalm 139, 4 says, Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. So Jesus is showing that he has this knowledge of people's hearts that only God does. See in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. The Lord searches our hearts. And Jesus knows their hearts. First Samuel 16, 7, Jesus, or, um, the Lord says, People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
in the first Kings eight, thirty eight to thirty nine. It says, for you alone know every human heart. This is Solomon praying. Um, this is Solomon's prayer concerning the temple. For you alone know every human heart. So God knows people's hearts. And Jesus clearly knows what these guys are debating within their hearts. So we all know that it's, we have this saying that says, uh, you know, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap, right? Saying one thing is easy, but can you actually do it? Doing it is something different. So Jesus says, which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and take up your mat and walk? Which is easier to say? So it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because one does not have to provide proof. You can't visually see someone's sins being forgiven, right? Any madman can claim to forgive sin. It's harder to say, rise and take up your mat and walk, because if it doesn't happen, then you look like an idiot. So I can say, your sins are forgiven, you're good. All right. But if I say, hey, okay, you're healed now, you can walk, and you don't do it, you look stupid. So by proving what is harder, Jesus therefore provide he proves that he can do what is easier. So it's easier to say, it's harder to say, take up your mat and walk. And it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. So Jesus is like, okay, I'm going to do the harder thing, which is by making this man take up his man and walk, therefore giving you evidence that I can do the easier thing to say, which is to forgive sin. Healing can be seen, forgiveness cannot. So by proving what is harder, he therefore proves he can do what is easier. So prophets, you know, false prophets were also to be put to death. There are a lot of capital crimes in the Old Testament. <laughs> In Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22, you know, you knew who a false prophet was by whether or not their prophecy came true. So, and false prophets had to be put to death in Israel. So that being said, it's easier to heal the body than to restore the soul. Practically speaking, it's easier to heal someone's body than to restore the state of their soul. But it's easier to say, it's easier to say. Your sins are forgiven, and it's harder to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk. So Jesus does a harder thing to say, therefore proving he can do the easier thing to say. So he says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. He then says the paralyzed man. Now, Son of Man is Jesus' favorite self-designation, of the, the thing he calls himself the most. It appears in Mark 14 times. Now, the Old Testament son of man, which in Hebrew is ben Adam, can mean a mere human being, not necessarily a male human being either. Just son of man is literally son of Adam. You know, we're all sons of Adam. Psalm 8, 4 says, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings, sons of Adam, that you care for them. And Ezekiel, the prophet, is called son of man over 99 times. So Jesus, he might just be saying that this human being himself, this man, has a divine authority to forgive sins, since he is, in fact, the Son of God. It can also just mean I, the Son of Man. However, it's likely recalling Daniel 7, 13 to 14, a very important passage in Scripture. Daniel prophesies, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, this is exousia, authority, power, and s authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So one like a son of man, a human being type figure coming with the clouds of heaven, giving this divine power and all people worshiping him. So Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And this is likely why he calls himself the son of man. He even quotes this outright later in the Gospel of Mark. So this is Mark 14, 61b to 64. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Verse 62, I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven, virtually identical language to Daniel 7. 
63 of chapter 14 of Mark, the high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. So, again, Jesus was not some guy preaching some nice things. He claimed to be God. And the Jews recognized it. The religious leaders recognized it. And this is why they tried to kill him. So the son of man is a divine title. Because he gets his authority from heaven, he has authority to forgive sin on earth. So Jesus, he makes it clear he's not all talk. Talk is cheap. It's one thing to say that the kingdom of God has come. Another thing to say the kingdom of God has come and I'm going to drive out this demon. Jesus is giving visible manifestations of his power, of his authority, his exousia. So he's given, he has authority to forgive sin and he's giving proof of that by raising this man from the dead. So people struggle with why Jesus calls himself the son of man. And I think a good reason why, you know, one scholar, at least a couple of scholars say it, is because it's very ambiguous. It can mean just human being, but it can also mean this divine figure from Matt, from Daniel seven thirteen and 14. So it's ambiguous. It has no political, military, messianic connotations, and it both reveals and conceals his identity at the same time. Likely, kind of like his parables. His parables, again, they would confuse some, certain people and they would enlighten other people. So son of man is kind of like a, it's an ambiguous term. That can be just a mere human being, but it, it can be this divine figure from Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And I think this is why Jesus called himself the son of man, because it's not super obvious that he's calling himself divine. That would bring about a whole bunch of problems in that time. People even heard the, the word Messiah. People were ready to rally because they thought the Messiah was going to be a, a victorious king who was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. So. You know, he, he wanted to stay away from some of this militaristic political associations of these certain terms. So Son of Man didn't have that, didn't have those connotations. And it's more ambiguous, likely allowing him to fulfill his ministry without drawing too much attention, too much unwanted attention um, until his time has come. So this, this term is used uh, about in three different contexts when he's talking about his divine authority in his earthly ministry, like forgiving sin and to alter the Sabbath laws when it concerns his suffering, death, and resurrection, and finally, his glorious return to save and to judge. So the Son of Man is, is the one who is truly human and must suffer and die, as has been said. For this same person is more than a man, and he must also be raised from the dead and return in glory. So the Son of Man, once again, is a divine title, Daniel seven thirteen fourteen, 14, but it's also ambiguous to not, draw too much unwanted attention and this is why I think Jesus used this term for himself so he says get up to you I say rise take up your mat and go home you know James Brown used to say get on up and Jesus tells him man just get on up now and this is a prophetic sign of the manifestation of the inbreaking kingdom of God once again these are all signs that are pointing to the kingdom that Jesus is ushering in with his his coming. And just a couple examples as we wrap up. Isaiah 35, 6. Then the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Isaiah uh, 33, verses 22 to 24 talks about um, no one living in Zion will say, I am ill, and the sins of those who dwell there will be forgiven. And even the lame will divide the spoils and the plunder. So this is fulfilling prophecies that the lame would be healed. And the Lord would forgive their sins. The great covenant, new covenant foretold of in Jeremiah 31. So all of this is what I'm saying is that these are all signs, manifestations of the kingdom that Jesus is ushering in. And everyone's like, I can't believe my eyes. I've never seen nothing like it. The last verse for tonight, it says, and he was raised and straight away, having took up the mat, he went up, he went out in front of everyone. As a result, this caused everyone to be beside themselves and they glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. We have never seen anything like this. But once again, 
basically it says they lost their minds <laughs> to be outside themselves. And once again, people are astonished at Jesus, but being astonished does not mean that they have true faith. But they did it right in front of his eyes. It was just a word. He said, you know, take up your mat and walk right in front of their eyes in public. And people are losing their minds. And they knew this was they, they knew this was the finger of God. Jesus made his point. In Exodus, when the Moses is is, is through through the, the Lord's powers is bringing about these plagues on Egypt, you know, one of the plagues was gnats. And the magicians of Pharaoh try to do the, the same thing or try to duplicate that plague. And they say, This is the finger of God. In Exodus eight, nineteen. And here we see the finger of God, who can forgive sin, not only heal the lame, but to forgive sin. So to wrap things up for tonight, spiritual sickness is a greater issue than physical sickness. Spiritual health is greater than physical health. And sometimes people that are in, have low physical health can improve their spiritual health by becoming closer to God than ever when they're on their sickbed. Sin may or may not lead to sickness. Not necessarily so, either way. And religious people can knowingly or unknowingly oppose God. These are the religious people of the day that were opposing Jesus. The people that knew the law the most were opposing Jesus. So just because, you know, people think that if the church, you know, did this, people would respond and come to Jesus. No, good actions can lead to evil reactions. We see that all the time in Scripture. In fact, that anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Second Timothy 3.12 says so. Just be aware of that. Just because people do good, like Jesus is doing good here, doesn't mean that people won't try to kill you. <laughs> they literally try to kill the Savior of the world, literally. Um, so again, Jesus' works, they confirm and validate his words. His works confirm and validate his words. His talk is not cheap. His authority is made manifest through his actions. Speaking of actions, faith is an attitude expressed in conduct, in our actions. It's active trust in spite of difficulties, overcoming obstacles, tearing off the roof if you need to. And this healing is essentially an object lesson. It's an illustration of the forgiveness with which it is linked, as has been said. The man is bound to his bed in physical paralysis. Others are bound to sin in spiritual paralysis. His release from the paralysis is a vivid picture of release from sins and guilt, as has been said. So just as the man was, was released from his physical paralysis, we can be released from our spiritual paralysis to sin through the blood of Jesus Christ who died for us and was raised on the third day. Trinity Father, we just thank you for this lesson, Lord God. We thank you that you can not only heal us from our physical infirmities, Lord God, but you can heal us from our much more deadly spiritual infirmities, Lord God. We know that death and disease are symptoms of sin, Lord God. And you've come to do away with all of that, Lord God, with your kingdom. We pray that your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, we ask that you would allow us to have the faith of the, the four men that carry the, the paralyzed man and of the paralyzed man himself to go above and beyond the faith that overcomes obstacles in our quest for healing from Jesus, Lord God. And the most important healing is our spiritual healing, Lord God. So cleanse our hearts, Lord God. Remove any sin out of our lives, Lord God, and help us to follow you with our whole hearts. Lord, I ask you to bless each and every person on this, this Facebook lesson, Lord God. We know people that hack, actually have physical ailments that they need healing from, Lord God. We ask that you would heal them, save them, so they can better serve you. So that it might be part of their testimony. So that you can bring glory to your name and the works of God might be revealed in them. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.